Uh, well, we're uh, delighted to uh, uh, welcome along Andrew McGinn, who's going to uh, give us a talk, which I think is uh, critical of libertarianism, at least the title is called, uh, Reaction in Libertarianism. Thank you. Uh, how long do I have for this? Uh, well, uh, how long do you want? I should have made them at least. I could, I could possibly, uh, yeah, I, oh. I, could, I could go on for that, I think. It's uh, whatever the format is. Uh, so I'll stand up to that and I'll say something down. Yes, uh, to the extent that this is a talk that's uh, uh, critical of libertarianism, I think mean, it's possibly not in the way that. Uh, uh, they were suggesting that my criticism is not that uh, uh, libertarianism is reactionary, it is that libertarianism ought to be reactionary, uh, and so it tends not to be. Um, the, it's hard to know where to start in all this because we kind of all come here by different routes, I think. Uh, and, and so see, my background, I considered myself libertarian for over 20 years now. Um, and very much in the sort of classical liberal night watchman state, um, gradualist kind of vein. Um, and I've come to the conclusion over the last few years that the, what I've always aimed at in that, uh, uh, the, the, the end result that, that was being aimed at that way simply wasn't achievable uh, in the kind of society we have. Uh, and what's fundamentally uh, at issue is the rejection of authority that is not simply uh, a libertarian view, but a liberal view and the dominant view of, of modern time. Uh, I'll through my note. The vision that I have is of a private domain that uh, is mostly left alone, uh, of private property, uh, of um, the economic efficiency that comes from the free market, of the services that are seen uh, widely as public services being provided efficiently, which means, in effect, they must be provided privately through a, through, through, through a competitive market. Uh, and the question where all this falls down is, is how we get to that uh, and, and what, what sort of society can actually deliver that? A uh, hundred years ago, the, uh, the, the, the proto-libertarians of that time, the liberals of that time, who, uh, who, who believed, who, who wanted to see much the same things, uh, felt that what was preventing uh, what they wanted from coming to pass was uh, what, uh, what we had a talk here a few months ago what was the ruling class, was a ruling class uh, that ruled in its own private interest against the general interest and that meant that policies like uh, protectionism um, would, uh, were favoured, not because they were seen to be in the general interest, but because they were in the private interest of the powerful. And the uh, program that was embarked on was to represent the general interest in power, to extend the franchise, to provide universal suffrage, to educate the uh, newly enfranchised in the uh, uh, in what their actual general interest was, and you know, we have to the, the Economist newspaper being founded and all that stuff. And the idea then was that because these things, because uh, uh, private property and, and uh, a laissez-faire state uh, was in the general interest, that when the general interest was re represented democratically, 
uh, that's what would come to pass. And obviously, it, uh, it doesn't work that way. For, for, for us to get back to the system that those people were trying to change and improve uh, would, in fact, be a massive advance for us today. Uh, the uh, uh, mass suffrage has failed to generate the, uh, to, to improve the general interest as we see it. So given that, now why is that? We all know why that is. It's because uh, a, a mass democracy is not the same thing as, uh, as the general interest being, uh, uh, being in power. What it means is power being built up in a different way that you can't uh, the, the, the struggle for power involves the trading of interests. We have in yeah, the 20, late 20th century the development of um, public choice economics and so on, the, the, the understanding of the, the power of the uh, uh, concentrated interest versus the dispersed interest uh, and all those things. So, in whose interest is it uh, that we get the uh, a kind of kind of society uh, that those people a hundred years ago were working for, and that we today are mostly working for? The general interest, maybe, but that doesn't help. The uh, up to a point, the interest of industry, and I, that that is kind of what we saw through the twentieth century. What improvements? here and there did come about, came about because there were strong commercial interests uh, who would benefit from freeing up of markets in certain directions, of uh, uh, opening, you know, increasing the, the freedom of people in particular areas to do, uh, to do the things that would support those industries, that would support the markets of those industries. Um, and, and to outsiders, you know, outside of this room, I, you know, the, the sort of views that we would put forward are, are, are generally identified as being the, uh, the views of powerful industry. That's not the way we tend to see it. Um, it's just that's kind of the visible face. In as much as the libertarian movement of the last hundred years has had any successes at all, they have been successes won through the, uh, uh, the likes of the Adam Institute. Uh, the Adam Smith Institute or Institute of Economic Affairs here, the, uh, uh, the very narrow selection of the pro-freedom uh, policies that have really suited the economic interests that have been able to advance them. It's kind of a, a, an aside, but it, it's interesting if you take the critics of uh, the criticisms of some of the, uh, the left libertarian movement, the uh, um, syndicalists and so on, they will emphasize the point that the, the mass industrial civilization of the 20th century uh, was kind of a choice. And I, I think in this respect, their criticisms are valid. They will emphasize the extent to which the shape of industry and society in the 20th century in the West was shaped by the interests of mass industrialism. You know, so we had you know, in the States the uh, the, uh, um, the interstate highway system is something they ran, rattle on about. The, uh, the education system you know, shaping people to, to go into careers in mass manufacturing, because mass manufacturing from the early and middle 20th century was the economically dominant and the politically dominant uh, form of industry. That, of course, has all fallen apart in recent decades as, the, uh, as mass manufacturing has waned in economic importance and, and things are kind of flapping around a bit loose now. So the, 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 there, is a, there is a kind of interest in freedom uh, from those commercial interests, but it's very partial. Uh, it doesn't... Uh, it, it, it's not the whole deal by any means. And you know, I think that the, the successes that can be won through that way have been won, and the failures uh, can't actually be helped. The real issue is that the interests 
against freedom uh, are so much more powerful. First, all politicians of whatever whatever colour of politician they claim to be, uh, the job of a politician is to gather and trade and increase power, and that's simply fundamentally opposed to uh, uh, the kind of uh, freedom-oriented uh, uh, government that we would want to see. You just there, there is no political mileage in surrendering power for no for, for nothing in exchange. If you seriously wish to achieve power politically, and I'm going to emphasize what I mean by politically, to to, to achieve power politically, you first and foremost have to grab whatever power you can. Even it's even power to do things that you don't particularly want to do. Once you have achieved some power, if you start from the bottom, you achieve, you, know, you get a few councillors, and you achieve the power to uh, 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 build a new um, council walk-in centre on one street rather than another. That is the basis of your political movement. That's what you build up from. You take that power, you use it. Uh, you use it in such a way as to win you more power to get onto better things, to get onto higher things. Uh, and that is how the political struggle works. It's how the democratic political struggle works, but it's actually how any political struggle works. Um, so uh, that's the yeah, that, that, that's you know, the first the first body of people who are opposed to libertarian policies are anyone who is actually trying to achieve power for whatever reason, um, even if they are personally somewhat sympathetic, uh, the very job description they have is to gather power for themselves, not as an end in itself, but as a process towards getting the power that they actually want. Uh, other interests against, obviously in the modern world, we have a public sector of 20-30%, a huge body of people with a direct interest in expanding the power of the state. And the third interest is whichever special interests, non-state special interests, are most efficiently organised because whichever parts of society are most effectively organised will, whatever the political system, be able to extract political favours as a result. And will benefit from the collection of power to the state. Um, and, and this is, an, this is a, a, an unstoppable majority of, of effective power. Uh, it can't be changed by fiddling with the voting system, fiddling with the constitution. This is the, the, the real power lies with the people who are interested in power. We are fundamentally not interested in power. We want to reduce power. We want to, in the extreme case, totally eliminate state power. Uh, and anyone who is, has any power is going to be opposed to that. Um, but if we can't eliminate power because we're losing, and um, we can't get power because we're losing, then there's always going to be power. So is there any avenue at all? Well, there is, because what all these things come out of, there isn't, it's not the possession of power that causes all these problems. It is the competition for power. And when I talk about politics, this is a, I mean, etymologically, it's not a correct um, uh, definition, uh, but I think by modern common usage, it fits pretty well. I talk of power as the competition for power. For, for, as I talk of politics as the competition for power. So uh, a state actor who makes a decision because he wants someone for himself because he ideologically wants a certain policy or whatever. If he wants to 
defeat France, so he declares war on France. That's not necessarily a political decision. A political decision is a decision that's made in the cause of achieving or retaining power. So if someone decides to invade France because that will make them more popular, because that will win them the support of the army or the arms manufacturers or the people who owe France money or whatever, that's a political decision in, in the way I use the term, as I say, probably not originally the correct way, but I think it fits with what people talk about. And it's politics that is the problem more than power. So if, you, if you take the, our current government in the narrow sense, the actual people with official power that have won elections, um, they're not terribly corrupt. They steal from us, they steal a bit for themselves. Uh, not terribly much by global standards, by historical standards. Uh, they're somewhat modest in their larceny. Uh, given the people who actually have official power, uh, the total amount they steal is, is certainly no more than they can afford. Uh, the damage that they do is two, three orders of magnitude greater than what they steal from themselves. Uh, you know, if we could just pay them that same money, if we could pay every MP an MP salary and expenses, uh, but have them not do anything, you know, we would be extremely well off. You know, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, <laughs> we, we could uh, cut... We, we let could, them play golf. Let them play golf, yes. Yeah. Let, let, them, let them be privileged. Let them, let them be more privileged than they are now. Let them have more. Let them... Uh, uh, let them live in luxury. 650 MPs living in luxury is, uh, uh, is, is a piffling expense uh, by the standards of the hundreds of billions that the, the government theoretically under the control of these 650 people is are taking from us and squandering. So you know, why are these people taking so much from us. They're not taking it from us for themselves. They're keeping for themselves a, a, a fraction of a percent of it, a fraction of one percent of it. Uh, it's like like the burglar, of course, or the car thief. You know, the uh, uh, the guy who breaks your car window, drives your car around and round at high speed for an hour and then dumps it, hasn't gained from you. Uh, more than a tiny fraction of what you've lost to him. He's taken from you uh, a, a short period of entertainment and nothing else. Uh, you have a bill for a hundred or a thousand pounds to recover and repair your car after it's been recovered, found and uh, uh, where, where we dumped it, assuming he didn't just set fire to it. And so it is with the politicians. What they take from us is huge, and what they keep for, for themselves out of it is tiny. And in the case of politicians, it's not primarily just because they're vandals. Uh, on the whole, they seem to believe that they're actually doing good. But it is the process, it is what they need to do to achieve power and to retain power, is to take as much as they possibly can from us and use it to buy support. And that's where the damage is done. That's where 99% of the damage is done. It's in not the abuse of power, but the competition for power. So this damage could be vastly removed, not eliminated, because we would still have these crooks living at our expense. But that's the least of our problems. This damage could be vastly reduced simply by removing the competition for power. I mean, this is the, uh, yeah, I, I, in order to, I, I don't know exactly where, where everyone here is coming from. I've shown up here only four or five times in the last year. Um, the, uh, so after I sort of planned this out, I, I have on my books to read list for a while uh, um, uh, 
Hobbes' uh, democracy, the god that failed. I imagine some of you are Hobbes and Yeah, Hobbes and Bible. Well, yes, I get. Yeah, it's interesting because you know, my view is certainly more Hobbes than Hoppe. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Obi make, makes an argument uh, entirely correctly that uh, a secure ruler um, has a long-term interest in the value of what he rules. So he will uh, not be so wasteful and destructive. Uh, a, 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 a king who strips his, uh, uh, his realm of assets in order to... Uh, uh, indulge himself is like a landlord who's uh, selling off the roof tiles of his house. It's it's, uh, it's it's not a sensible way for them to proceed, and it's not the way they would proceed. Uh, whereas a caretaker who has temporary sovereignty, who has the uh, and yeah, the extreme cases in the British Constitution with the, with the unlimited power of Parliament, but the limited duration of power for any particular government. They can do whatever they want for five years. Uh, and that's a recipe for uh, a destructive mining of the assets that they can use but not keep. And that, this is the argument Hoffman makes, and it's correct. But I think it's a less important argument because, as I say, because these people actually aren't all that corrupt. That's not, not what they're about. They're not stripping the assets of the, com of the country for their own benefit, they're using the assets of the country in order to keep themselves in power. And of course, in reality, we're not dealing with 650 MPs because their power is, though theoretically unlimited, practically uh, tremendously limited. And over the centuries, uh, power has been dissipated and every everyone has got this little bit of power and the uh, we've seen the goings on I've largely ignored them but you can't escape them the the, the power of the press has been very much uh, uh, under public attention recently that is real power uh, they have that power it's valuable to them they can trade it they can benefit from it, they can work with it to get more power, they can favour their friends and disfavour their enemies, uh, the civil service, the educationists, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the myriad disparate power sources in our society. None with formal power. Uh, one uh, name for the, the, the point of view that I'm advancing here is formalism. That's uh, 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 something that's been put forward at one time. One time. If, uh, if everyone who has any kind of power has that power formally and owns it, uh, then it's a parallel argument to the uh, efficiency argument for private property in the first place. If someone has clear title to something, whether that be uh, a tree or a machine, or the right to get paid for being a diversity consultant, uh, then they will be able to, they will only be able to make the most efficient use of that asset if they have freedom to make whatever use of it they choose. If they're restricted to only, if you can take the, the fruit from a tree but not the wood, or the wood from a tree but not the fruit, if you can. Uh, get paid for occupying a position, but not for uh, turning it into something that's automated and no longer needs to be done, or making it unnecessary. You know, the, 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 uh, the number of people who are employed to not solve problems that, uh, uh, if actually solved, would put them out of a job. Um, are just examples of people of, of you know, a, a communist factory manager who has the the right to benefit from running a factory but not from selling it. Um, that's a parallel argument there. I think yeah the weakness 
in um, in a lot of things is that it isn't again when I read you know, if you read through Hoppy or Rothbard or so on they don't talk about power as such because they're against it you know that there is there is uh, honest work and there is crime and the exercise you know, in this worldview the exercise of state power is just a kind of crime that is no fun, not fundamentally any different from the crime of a, a uh, what would the, the, the term stationary band, or the often term stationary bandits and roving bandits. Yes, there, there's no no moral distinction between the stationary bandit and the roving bandit. Uh, so they don't talk about power, and we hear about yeah the, the natural. I hope you talk to the natural order, the natural order being uh, um, a voluntary association of private property owning individuals. Uh, now, I'm very much in favour of that. I think that would be a great, uh, uh, a great thing, but it's not natural. Uh, the, the natural order uh, is, is tribal, tribal solidarity, warfare, warlords, slavery. That's natural order. We can do better than that, uh, you know. But we. we uh, but this is one area where we need to not conform to nature, but but work against nature and be aware that we're working against nature. If we were. So maybe, I mean, people have brought this up, that in pre, pre-agriculture, things might have been different. It's hard to know. Uh, and I've come across many theories of, you know, the, the egalitarian, libertarian, non, uh, um, you know, voluntaristic uh, um, hunter-gatherer societies. I, 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 it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm not convinced either way, and it doesn't matter because I don't want to be a hunter gatherer. Uh, when you uh, uh, when you settle the land and tie yourself to the land and tie yourself to uh, uh, artifacts uh, and infrastructure that you need to live the lifestyle you you, you are, then you are wh- wherever you started from. You are now in the realm of power. Uh, in a time of danger, uh, people will follow a strong man who will protect them. Uh, I, I, I think it's a, a failure, again, as you know, Rothbard says, yeah, given this, this uh, the, the freedom to, uh, that, that the natural order provides, no one would sign the sort of social contract that the uh, uh, collectivists uh, like to posit we've somehow implicitly joined in. In fact, in time of stress, people, people do. That's not to validate the, uh, the, the sort of social contract theorists, because it's not clear that any of us today ever agreed to any of what is being done to us. But as a matter of human behaviour, uh, in times of great danger, people do look to a strong man to protect them. They will. They, they offer loyalty in exchange for protection. Uh, we see that you know, wherever uh, civilized society breaks down, yeah, that's not a good thing. Uh, it's better if civilized society doesn't break down. Uh, but to simply classify. Uh, a leader who commands followers as just a particular kind of criminal uh, is to not necessarily to make a, a moral misjudgment, uh, but to make a practical misjudgment of, of how these things actually work. Um, but we've had, yeah, there is an alternative. If you do have a ruler who is secure, I haven't said, I, 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 I spoke to this group a few years ago on a similar line, that a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the origin for this line of thinking uh, that I've been following the last few years uh, comes from a blogger uh, of the blog Unqualified Reservations. Uh, Menke is an old bug, as he calls himself, he's actually a... Uh, a computer programmer in San Francisco. Um, 
uh, he, uh, uh, it, it, it's following his ideas uh, largely that brought me this way now. He goes further and he posits uh, a, a, a new uh, form of uh, social structure, uh, which he called neo cannibalism and, and the last time I spoke to this group, so that was just on three years ago, uh, I, I spoke about neo cannibalism uh, he, His ideal there is that we treat political power as we would like to treat any other kind of property. It is owned. If you have power in government, if, you know, if, if someone today has power to command 10% of the resources of the state, give them 10% of the shares in the government, privatise it, they can keep it, sell it, <coughs> they can take the profit, no longer for minute by, as a benefit of manipulating the system, but just for themselves, just pay them, let them sell on their interest, if they sell it on, they no longer have it, uh, and turn a state into a joint stock company uh, that will be run, like any joint stock company, by its owners, in the interests of the owners. And that sounds quite alarming because you know, they will steal from us. Um, you know, those with power, whether it be this kind of formal state power or the informal state power that exists today, uh, will steal from us. But less than you'd think. You know, what, what, we wibble on about the Laffer curve. Uh, even in the short term, uh, we are clearly you know, somewhere near, yeah, it's a difficult thing to argue in small detail, you could say we're over, you could say we're under. We're clearly somewhere near the peak of the lap of curve. No state can actually take from us very much more than the current state is currently taking from us. Uh, it couldn't get worse in that respect. If they attempt to uh, increase their depredations beyond what they currently are, they're likely to find that they actually pocket less than, than is the case at the moment. And that's taking a short-term view. That's taking a year-by-year-by-year -by -year -by -year view. If you take the position of an owner who is going to own the state for the next 50 years, the next 100 years, who will be able to sell on his interest uh, or... or, or or leave it to his, to his heirs, um, their max, the, the, the maximal net present value they can extract from their sovereignty over us uh, will be achieved less by, you know, by increasing the value that the state, that the, the, the realm uh, is able to produce. Uh, and so if you have perfect security and a, perfect, a perfectly long-term time horizon, any funds you extract from the economy uh, are actually going to cost you more in the long run. Uh, the, uh, the best thing you can do with any assets that you have command over is to reinvest them into your, your firm, which is your slaves, us, uh, in order to maximise their future value. Now, that's an extreme case and not a realistic one. But the, even at a realistic level, uh, a, a CEO who owned the power of the state securely and completely uh, would maximise his, 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 his shareholder value uh, by allowing us to do the most efficient thing, by cutting taxes to a quarter, a tenth, what they are now, uh, by allowing us the freedom to uh, develop as we can most benefit from doing, 
by yeah, rather than taking particular goodies from us, simply rather than that, yeah, it's always going to be more efficient to pay for what you want than take it because if someone would rather give up the money than give up the, uh, you know, let's say, yeah. We imagine the, 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 yeah, the person who wants to see all these crowds doing, marching up and down in particular patterns. Uh, yes, you can command a particular thousand people to march up and down and do the, the Sasha Baron Gogan things or whatever uh, the lunacies that, that people want. Uh, but if people object to that more than they object to simply losing money, it's going to be more efficient to take the money for them and pay for it. And within limits, it's going to be more efficient still to not take the money, but to have them have the assets, have the increased value of the assets. Now, we talk about a joint stock company and a CEO and so on. Uh, and there's an obvious problem when you're talking about what Moldberg calls a soft corp, a sovereign corporation, of how you enforce your corporate governance. Uh, yeah, it, given that the uh, the CEO has control of all the uh, the, the monopoly of force that is the the, the possess, possession of the modern state, uh, what sort of uh, uh, assets do a mono what sort of power does a minority shareholder have to uh, defend its interests? And Mulberg comes up with this uh, complex uh, pattern of you have an armed force. The armed forces have guns. The guns have cryptographic electronic weapon locks. The uh, locks are managed through a, a, a public key system. I mean, he's right. It, it works in theory. Uh, it, it's all doable. Uh, I can't build it and get it right perfectly. Uh, I don't know who can. I, I don't believe in it. So as attractive as this vision is, I don't buy that. And, and I, that, that's actually the, the, the thing that I was talking about. Uh, on previous occasions, uh, that we we can't protect minority shareholders in a joint stock sovereign corporation. Um, that, that's not a useful practical way to do it. So we're left with the uh, the predecessor of the joint stock stock corporation. We're left with the uh, the family business, uh, and that's the uh, that's the state of affairs uh, that I, I think will actually get us closer, closer than anything else, closer than anything else that has been tried to what I started talking about, to a society where we actually do have freedom, uh, are less oppressed uh, by state power. Um, what we need is a sovereign family business, uh, which traditionally went by the name of monarchy. Um, monarchs simply did not mess the state, mess the country about in the manner of any kind of competitive government. And yeah, we know the problems of democracy, but the problems of democracy are the problems of, let's say, a, a fascist dictatorship. A fascist dictatorship is really just another kind of democracy. Uh, perhaps they don't specifically bother with elections, but they're still a, a, a mass movement they still need to retain mass active support um, and popularity. Uh, 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 no, no fascist dictatorship is less concerned about maintaining its, pro its popularity than a democratic government. Uh, it, it, the same problems carry on. I, I remember reading uh, Carl Schmitt, you know, Carl Schmitt talked a lot of sense about the problems of politics, the problems of democracy, particularly. Uh, but uh, having made all these correct observations, he went and joined the Nazi party, uh, which I think, I think fascism is the natural, obvious response to democracy. Uh, I think you know, someone coming in today, if we didn't have the, the 20th century history to guide us, I think if you looked with an honest eye at government today, at the state of what we have, you would say what we need here is something like, and you would describe fascism. 
Uh, it's the obvious response. But, yeah, it's been tried. It didn't actually work terribly well. Uh, it's, yeah, in a sense, compared to the, the, the modern evolved democracy that we have here today, fascism is worse. It's, it's, it's largely because it's more dependent on popularity. The, the great asset democracy has, and democracy, you know, what we have here, we are given all these criticisms, it takes from us as much as it can possibly take from us and wastes most of it. Uh, and even so, we actually live better than most of those under alternatives. The reason that democracy works as well as it does is not because it is responsive to the public desires. It's actually because people believe it is responsive to the public's desires. A democracy actually has to do less to remain in power. A democratic government has an easier job of staying in power than your average military uh, generalissimo has to do to remain in power. Uh, the, the, the military dictator is more dependent on maintaining his popularity in order to retain power than uh, your average elected president or prime minister. Your average elected president, the people say, well, we don't like him, but, you know, he won. It's fair. He's legitimate. Uh, we maybe get rid of him next time. Maybe we won't because, you know, there are other interests. It's not as simple as that the press will have its say and the civil service will have its say and there's all these, the courts will have their say and perhaps only 20, 30% of the population will actually vote for this guy, but he'll get in again. Um, but, you know, he is legitimate. He won. We're not going to fight. We're not going to uh, 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 burn in we're not going to riot. Uh, a democratic government has an easier job of staying in power. And that is the strength of democracy. That's the good thing about democracy. Uh, there's often people, yeah, there's a common way of thought that's, that's followed by good, intelligent people. I, I think, yeah, the, the prime example of this is, say, uh, Douglas Carswell, the, uh, the Tory MP. Uh, he said, yeah, okay. We have democracy. It's not very democratic. There's all sorts of bugs and loopholes and weaknesses in it. Uh, but we sort of have it. And we have this government. And it's not really very good. In order to make the government better, we need to make the dem democracy more democratic. It's kind of obvious that we have a government that's fairly good. We have a government system that's fairly democratic. If the system was more democratic, if we elected our police chiefs and city mayors and uh, we had open primaries and all the other things that are in, in his book, um, yeah, our really, you know, on comparative terms, fairly good government would get better. Of course, he's, he's a good chap, but he's completely wrong. The, uh, the, the, the flaws in democracy are the very things that make our government bearable. The fact that it doesn't have to exert itself in so strenuously to command so many resources just to maintain itself in power uh, are, are <clears throat> what means it can actually let things go here and there, let, let people go their own way, do their own thing. Um, and you know, people understand this because it's a common argument. Yes. I'm in favour of democracy. Yes, this should be more democratic. But actually, this particular one thing that you're saying should be more democratic, although you're right in general that everything should be more democratic, it just seems to me that if this particular thing would be more democratic, everything would go to pot. It, wouldn't work. it would work less well. If we elected our police chiefs, uh, that we would have more problems. If we had let uh, local voters choose their candidates, it would be worse, all the rest of it. Um, so although democracy is a good thing, actually, and having more of it would in general terms be a good thing, actually having this bit more or that bit more or that bit more would be worse. And people see that, but they don't make the connection that, in fact, the very strength of our system is its lack of democracy. 
and that anything that makes it even less democratic would probably improve it further. Uh, how long have I been rabbiting on for? Are people getting bored? Yeah. Not terribly long. Well, quite a long time. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about monarchy. We'll finish up. We'll just talk about... I haven't really followed my notes at all, but that's okay. They were there for if I got stuck. Um, because even defenders of monarchy, I think, fall into a mistake. Uh, again, when Hoppe was defending monarchy as though unjust and not desirable, nevertheless better than democracy, he, he, he pointed out that monarchs actually had great trouble even collecting taxes and so on, but their power wasn't secure. And you know, generally, historically, that was the case. But the results of that weren't good. The results were similar to democracy. You know, if, you, if, you, if you take history books from even 60, 70 years ago or any time before that, you know, the, the bad king, good king era, uh, it was pretty explicit a bad king was a king who dithered, who gave way to his advisers, who wasn't strong, who wasn't decisive, because when that happened, you got a power struggle. You got people other than the king having power and using it, not even for their own benefit, but against each other in order to attempt to improve their power or increase their power. This is democracy. This is what we've institutionalized, the bad king, the, the, the indecisive king. Interestingly, we still have the instincts, the reflexes of, of a monarchical people. And, and, and again, we always hear the complaints. People will vote for a, a politician who is strong and confident, even if they disagree with him, rather than a ditherer and weak man who they disagree with. And I think, yeah, that is a correct in instinct on the people's part. But of course, it serves no purpose when even the strong, confident king is going to be voted out of office in five years anyway, and is nevertheless going to have to fight for power, and there's nevertheless going to be a power struggle and all the destruction that causes. So I'm not a, when I, the, the, the monarchy that I advocate, advocate is not the medieval monarchy of powerful barons fighting civil wars against each other, uh, of monarchs who had to beg to be allocated enough money to uh, 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 upkeep their palaces. I want the Sun King. I want what Charles I wanted but couldn't get because he was an idiot. Uh, what, what Charles II pretty much did manage to get until his idiot brother inherited. Uh, an absolute ruler who has no need to manipulate, to play off allies against each other, to uh, uh, weaken his enemies and strengthen his friends, one who is secure in his power and therefore has the country as an asset and wishes, like any intelligent holder of an asset, to maximise its value. And you only have to think, if you take an idiot, if you take Prince Charles, who is not an admirable man in terms of, you know, compared to a, you know, a, a history PhD like Gordon Brown, who is a very, who is an, a very intelligent man, um, you know, Prince Charles is a bit of a plonker. But really, can you imagine Prince Charles as King Charles III, absolute ruler, being half as bad as Gordon Brown was? Not because he's a good man, he's an idiot. But, but where is his interest to do the damage that Gordon Brown did? Gordon Brown was a politician. Everything he did was directed to maintaining his popularity, to more to maintaining his position. Um, and intelligent man as he was, uh, the result for us was pretty bad. And as these more or less intelligent, but mainly very intelligent, mainly very exceptional people come and go as our re leaders, it makes very little difference because they're all constrained by the same uh, um, environment. So the only way we can actually achieve the sort of conditions 
that our, our, our forebears a hundred years ago who supported mass suffrage and all these weird innovations wanted is to have a king who is so completely secure in his power that he doesn't have to fight for it. Very well, unusually, some of these comments sound of democracy. Uh, Christian? Yes, <clears throat> I'm not sure I agree with um, your point of view, as, as you would expect, there would be people who would agree here. Um, I think there are several problems that uh, you raised. Um, the first one is um, to think that there could be power without competition for power. It's like saying that there could be football without goals. Um, I mean, goal scoring is part of football, and if somebody has power, there will be people who will challenge that power. And you can never make power secure. I mean, it's, uh, you know, poison, whatever, uh, coups, and uh, so on. Also, when you say that a property owner maximizes his property when he is secure in his titles and so on, it doesn't mean that he, that he succeeds. So you have a problem of knowledge. You may have a very good ruler, secure in his power and so on, without competition, who decides that what will be best for his property, for the kingdom, is in the long run a total catastrophe. For instance, saying, I don't want industrialization uh, in, say, 18th century, uh, industry is bad, uh, I've read all these romantic poets and so on, and I decide that my country would remain agricultural. Also, you have competition coming from other countries. So you may suddenly find yourself with the decision of going to war, not going to war, joining coalition, things like this. And that is not necessarily good for the country, but if you don't do it, you may have other problems. Finally, I think that competition for power is good, but you seem to confuse and you gravitated around this. You seem to confuse economic power, which is a power to serve, and political power, which is the power to coerce. Now, people who have economic power may wield enormous power. For instance, if you can give me a job and pay me, you can also tell me, I want you to be here every morning at 8 o'clock. I want you to work on Sundays. I want you to do this, that, and the other. That is economic power. It is a power to serve because you rendered a service to me. But I can say, no, the limit of your power is the limit of the service that you offer. But the idiot who stops me at border and asks me to open my suitcase and you know, do all these sort of things doesn't render me any service. But I cannot defect. I cannot say, I don't want you to open my suitcase. I don't want you to ask me questions. I don't want you to look at my passport. I have to surrender. There is no exchange there. So I think that, yes, we want power, but the power to serve. Political power has only one limit, which is the death of the victim. Whereas economic power has a limit, which is the service that you render, which is acceptable or not acceptable. So I, I'll stop here. Well, those are, I've got, I've replied, but yeah, yeah, those are excellent points. Uh, the, first, the most important point, yes, uh, the, the, there was a thought experiment that Mulbert gave on his blog of, of the ring of Nagel, of a, a ruler or who had a magic ring who could strike dead anyone within his, his island and therefore had power that was absolutely secure and 
you know, had this thought experiment, when, then what will you do? In reality, no one is that secure in power. So there's two questions. One is, can a ruler be substantially more secure in power than, our current, than, than is the case in uh, a democracy? And I think the answer is yes, but it's more, it's not about constitutions, it's not about institutions, it's about belief. Uh, um, until 500 years ago, it was believed that the king had a right to power, and that made them a good deal more secure, at least from the commoners, although there was competition at that point between, uh, amongst the aristocracy because centralisation had not yet got to the stage where a king practically could rule uh, a kingdom rather than a, a, a barony, uh, uh, as effectively as became the case in the 17th century. But so that's one question. I think even the, the, our modern system celebrates competition for power. It encourages it. It looks for it wherever it can. Uh, so I think we can have substantially less competition than, for power, uh, not even by discouraging it, merely by ceasing to encourage it. The second question is, given that these, that these problems come from the competition for power, does reducing the competition of power actually reduce the problems? It could be, theoretically, that the mere existence of a challenger uh, would cause just the same amount of problems as a whole wealth of very powerful challengers. Uh, uh, dictators are often accused of being paranoid and of going to great lengths to put down rivals who, in fact, are little threat to them. But then they do seem to keep getting overthrown. I think, yeah. Very few of them, uh, you know, the, again, this is a brain over dinner squeezer point as well. Yeah. Uh, most dictators don't last as long as many democratic presidents do. Uh, very, a small proportion last 20, 30 years. Most of them last two or three. Uh, so I, I think they are not being paranoid. I think the, uh, uh, the reason they are so extreme in their fight to retain power is because they need to be, and frequently they still fail. So yeah, it, it, this is not a, yeah, this is very much a second best theory. Uh, if, if we could have uh, um, Rothbard's freely competing uh, uh, private security companies and that actually worked and they didn't degenerate into warlord states in a matter of months, uh, that would be enormously preferable to living under a secure absolute monarchy. Yeah. This is very much a second best. This is, I think, the best we can get. Uh, uh, there is, I, I only equated um, uh, coercive power, as you say, with economic power by analogy. Entirely correct. They are different things. It would be much better if nobody had coercive power. Uh, but I, I don't see that. I think everyone always has that splitting up and limiting their coercive power just causes this dispersed system. Again, think of the, the uh, African dictatorship where every policeman has the power for himself because there's not the, the efficient central administration that we have that commands them. They're not ta the, 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 the government doesn't efficiently collect taxes to pay, pay the policemen. The policemen are just allowed to extract, extort bribes from all and sundry. That's, that's divided power. Shall I go back? Right. Um, I find a lot in the speeches that's um, appealing. And I don't know if we have an enlightened monarch, marriage razor, or Joseph II, and Lord to remain, that would probably be preferable to the system we have at the moment. However, what fail safe mechanisms? Should we have if we have a absolute despot, no more functions in the position of power, particularly an inclination of the political level? Um, again, you're picking an example from the, the most unstable and uh, uh, sort of era of. of uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Pick pick me pick me a stable, secure ruler who acted that way. Uh, I, I think you know, we go out of our way to select the megalomaniacs as our rulers under the current system. A random choice would be an improvement. 
As I say, I didn't uh, mention the only potential ruler I've mentioned by name is Prince Charles, who I don't think very much of. Uh, but that would be you know, the conditions under which an absolute monarch would rule. An average person, a near average person, though there aren't that many monsters in the world, and the monsters are usually made monsters and don't come from uh, privilege. Chuck, you have a bit of uh, I've got two questions. One follows on from that question, which I don't think you addressed sufficiently. So even if we do have a completely secure monarchy, which is then inherited by an idiot, <laughs> you then you need a, a, a way to deal with that. Historically, they do. Um, and if an idiot gets his hands on power in practice, it will be taken away from them and some sort of regency. In the same way that if a very wealthy heiress, like the heiress to the L'Oreal shampoo uh, fortune, starts wasting all her money in practice, uh, her power of attorney gets taken away from her, she gets declared insane or something like that. Um, the way Goldberg deals with it is by, is by separating ownership and control. Mm -hmm. So he says you have a load of shareholders, they own it. But they pick a CEO. Yes. And so a monarch could choose to do the same thing. And again, that would be a, uh, that would be uh, superior. Again, I, I. But of course, that I I, I don't believe in the cryptographic weapon locks. And your solution is is monarchy a uh, monarch, monarchical believing society. Yeah. Now again, an idiot an idiot king might just have enough sense to uh, uh, let someone else run run things for him. That's not guaranteed, and it's not ideal because there could be competition for the position of regent. Uh, but, uh, you know, disasters have happened, catastrophes have happened to democracies, uh, perhaps at a higher frequency than have happened to secure monarchies. Disasters can happen. This is not a, a utopia I'm proposing here, uh, not by any means. My, my second point follows on from what Christian said, which he drew a distinction between economic power and political power and said that political power is true power, whereas economic power vanishes as soon as uh, you know, mm. the counterparty um, did, uh, no longer agrees. Um, and I don't, think between, I don't think rent falls neatly into either category. I agree, because yes. you pay rent to uh, a landlord and you're perfectly happy to do so, you consent to do so. Whereas if you have to pay it to a, a state, even though you can leave the country, people pull this tax and they get up in arms about it. And so I was wondering if you have any, any comments about that. And that's, like I, I, for example, consider the land value tax, or if a state collects rents, that to be a sort of natural tax. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and uh, I think that the, I, I didn't, I, I considered talking about that, but it's, uh, there is indeed a gray area between economic power of the sort Christian described, coercive political power, and in between you have this sort of ownership of land. And you know, we have the fiction in this country that a freehold is a grant of land from the monarch who remains sovereign over that land and you have limited rights and so on. And again, in, in, in cramming the uh, uh, sort of Hockey Rothbard view uh, over the last week, they talk of, um, uh, yeah, a community where the public areas, the roads, the meeting places are owned, are, are, are open to, to members of the community in good standing only, and the owners, be them individual or, or associations, have the right to exclude whoever they want. And you could go as far as saying that in order to walk the streets of this town, you must be a member in good standing of the community. You must go to church every Sunday. You must allow the inspectors to come into your bedroom once a week to check for pornography and drugs, whatever, whatever, whatever. Well, and, and there isn't enough. That's uh, well, quite, yeah. That's, uh, uh, yeah, and that's, yeah, they're praxeologists. If your reasoning from first principles tells you that a highly homogenous, isolated community cannot live by its own moral standards in that way against the disaffection of a few misfits, then your reasoning from first principles has gone wrong. I don't think there's a flaw in their reasoning, but it, it's of limited relevance to the world we live in today, which is far more mixed up and less homogenous. Thank you.
Well, yes, you started by saying, and I understand it, that um, the, Demo the, the democratically elected have to do such silly things to get elected and to get re-elected. Whereas someone who is quite assured can really do dumb things because um, he's not worried at all. Or worse, he's not dumb. He's concerned for the future of his country. And um, he is, say, the Tsar, or he is the Kaiser in 1914, forward looking, concerned for the future, wanting to do the right thing. Well, within five years, they and their offspring have gone from power and did an appalling war. Well, um, and I think a libertarian, libertarians don't, really, don't think there needs to be a ruler. And that's, that's the idea. That um, every man in the musket over his mantelpiece. Uh, can go and turf out the um, temporary occupant with very little power if he tries it on. I mean, if you don't think there should be a, a rule, and that, of course, you can go with it, you think that, in the sense of rules, there's always going to be, but, mm. and see so why there should be. If we're pretty much agreed upon things, then there can be a ruler of the day, chosen at random, as you say, just to occupy the throne and say, no, no rules required, no tax required, good night. Um, that could be a way of doing it, which, of course, is a way of not doing it. That's, that's the point. You don't, you don't have to do it. What rules is, is the fact that there's no one with any power, particularly. Everyone got a musket over the mantelpiece. If anyone tries it on, the street gangs up against them. Because there's no bigger power than a hundred people, five hundred people. Well, yeah, do it. You know, if, if you achieve that, I will not be agitating for a king mm -hmm. to, uh, uh, to, to come and rule over your, your, your peaceful anarchy. Uh, uh, trust me. But uh, 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 in the meantime, I, I, I set my sights a little lower. Uh, the Kaiser uh, seemed to be under the belief that there was a vast conspiracy of non-monarchical governments who wanted to expunge monarchy from the face of the earth. And he was right, and unfortunately he lost. Um, uh, but yeah, if you're looking at the 20th century, the big ideological war was the First World War, the war on monarchy. Um, the Second World War was, to, was, was a little scrap over land. The, the First World War was the ideological crusade against, primarily against the German and Austrian monarchies. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, again, there's a whole thread of Moldenberg's thoughts on the, uh, the, the, the history of the Puritan Republican view that I didn't go into. That means that noise above me is speaking the plain truth. Good, <laughs> David. I thoroughly enjoyed your uh, tap on uh, the system that we have at the moment. I think you're absolutely right. You you do correctly identify yet a further problem with the system that we have to live under, which, uh, as you say, is uh, politicians who, in their strivings for power, promise to and do do catastrophically damaging things. So the, up to that point, I'm entirely with you. Yeah. But the, the prescription, which is instead of arguing for uh, freedom and liberty and uh, the elimination of, of political power, we should instead seek to convert people to the virtues of uh, absolute power, uh, <laughs> which might be transferable in some corporate form or not. I've got have another the job trying to persuade people that there are. Uh, I, mean, I, I can't possibly see the advantage of trying to argue for something which is a second best on any view, and b is, is everybody will think I'm mad as opposed to money to me. Well, I, there is something in what you say, but yeah, what I'm arguing for is what the majority of humanity believed, the majority of human history. Uh, yeah, we have lived under monarchs. The uh, loyalty to one's monarch has been a virtue. Uh, uh, sedition against one's monarch has been a crime and a sin. People believe that. People could believe that again. Uh, I, they, they, I, I would make the case, and this is a whole other strand that I didn't go into, that the modernization of society began, the modern era began when kings, due to the advances in governing technology, managed to centralize power to themselves, managed to exclude the warring barons. And such a spurt of intellectual and economic development happened at that point 
uh, but people got carried away and figured they could do without them. That's, that's a story, and there are other stories, but in fact, you, you could paint the story of this 16th, 17th centuries as being that just as well as it's painted as the, uh, you know, the advance of reason and freedom and the limiting of central power, which is the weak interpretation of history that we're so familiar with. Stephen? You speak uh, warmly of monarchy, and yet you seem to speak um, a bit disparagingly of dictatorship. Yes. What, what is the difference between the two of you? Excellent question. Uh, the difference is that one dictator has exactly the same right to his position as the next dictator, whereas a monarch has the right of inheritance. So he has this head start. If General Fred is running the country uh, and Colonel Bob thinks that he would do a better job of it, then as far as anyone else is concerned, there's not much to choose between General Fred and Colonel Bob except who will do them the most good. However, if King Fred has inherited the kingdom and some guy Bob reckons he could do a better job, he will never be King Fred, he will never be King Bob, but most he can be Generalissimo Bob or President Bob. King Fred has this little head start that gives him this edge, that gives him this extra security and therefore this extra freedom to not politic as much as uh, President Bob so or General Bob. So a dictator which pass, passes the line down through a family member. It's called the king. Uh, so so something great like chain of beams. So something great like, chain of beams. So something uh, like uh, something North Korea. Uh, North Korea is a bit of an embarrassment on this point. I did, I, 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 I blog, I meant to actually say that, I, I, the, these views have been expressed on my blog over uh, some years now, and I will leave a few, uh, the, the blog is Anomaly UK. I did draw attention to the fact that under one reading of my views, the ideal progression of society is to do what North Korea has done, and that that doesn't seem to be a great, uh, uh, greatly in favour of, of, of what I'm saying, and uh, I, I discussed what sort of excuses could be brought up at this point. Who really is in charge in North Korea? I, mean, I, I don't know. Sure, Maybe it just needs so. longer. But that, yes, that is an embarrassment to me, I admit. And I have admitted publicly that North Korea, I would have said, was a, probably the right way to go, but doesn't actually seem to be working out. China, on the other hand, you know, or even Putin, well, I'm not sure about Putin, but again, it's so hard to know what's really going on, what, what power these people really have. Uh, but yeah, North Korea, not great. Um, they seem to do, they seem to devote an awful lot of effort into staying in power, which of course is what I'm trying to avoid. Now, maybe that's because there is no real security that what we really have is a massive internal constant civil war amongst the ruling class. Maybe it's because Christian's right, and the, uh, the, the mere existence of the, merely reducing the competition for power doesn't actually reduce the damage caused by the competition for power. Well, there was a philosophical view, wasn't there, that, made, that, that stabilised the king. The great chain of being, that metaphysical, mm. and the, that, that was broken when, when actually uh, Richard II was uh, usurped. Well, there were usurpations, there were many uh, well, usurpations. Well, that led to yeah. the War of Roses. Yes, in a... Uh, well, my question was going to be more about hereditary dictatorships, but obviously you yes, that was yes. the previous question. I think North Korea is perhaps as embarrassing as you think, necessarily, because... Well, I make excuses, mentioned... but they're excuses. Well, my excuse would be, you mentioned earlier the international democratic conspiracy. Yes, um, yes. Uh, by a sort of for want of a person name. Um, so I would say the reason that North Korea devotes so much effort to stay in power is not from an internal threat, but uh, from the external press, from the international democratic conspiracy. And so therefore my question is, and, and obviously I don't necessarily expect you to have an answer to it, because it essentially boils down to how can we get rid of another threat to the monitor power. So what about external threats? What about external threats? Yeah. Um, Big question, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I, I, obviously, uh, in, like any other government, uh, there will 
you know, your, your, your monarchical government will need an, uh, a defence policy. It probably won't need an imperial policy. Uh, that doesn't seem to have been very profitable, even in the 19th, 19th century, and certainly not in the 20th or 21st. Uh, so that would be a, a somewhat squandering of resources, but a defence policy would be needed. As to the specific problem of facing the democratic conspiracy, uh, either you are somewhere so small and insi insignificant you can get away with it, or we spread the word globally so that sympathy starts to get stirred up. Yeah, the Americans like, yeah, they, they, they oppose monarchy, but they like royals. You know, there might be an angle there. Um, yeah, uh, there was another question. What was it? Yeah, yeah, and North Korea, yeah, as I say, I, I have excuses. The international democratic conspiracy is one. The, um, uh, uh, the possibility that the, in, the, the hereditary ruler of North Korea is in fact a powerless figurehead is another. I, I have excuses. I would prefer not to have to have excuses, but for what it's worth, I have excuses. I, I should imagine it's not the social fabric isn't strong enough. It hasn't had enough, enough time to establish a monarchy. For what would be a state it's of been a while. It's uh, I, I I'd hate to tell the people of North Korea, you know, hang in there. It will get better. You know. Well, you know I, I think, I think that's, <laughs> this is one thing that might be misunderstood about the state. It's one of the reasons why you won't get these defensive agencies being like a state because it takes hell of a long time to establish a state. You can't, once it's got rid of it, you, you probably won't be able to do it in your eyes. Bob? Um, the divine right is possessed by the son of a usurper, generally. Uh, that was the difficulty with the um, divine right of kings, was that you had to explain yeah. that God, God ordains this, but if you're successful in your toppling of a monarch, then you're the right monarch as well. That's how it works, because God has allowed you to, to win. Now, this is a argue, you have to give a straight face, I would say, of course, but, um... Henry IV found it hard to argue. Yes. But, of course, sometimes the public... He wasn't a good arguer. Sometimes the public are almost a bit like you. They'll say, all right, but we pretend he's the real king. The point is, it was all made of pieces. There was a civil war. He's won the bloody thing. Just let him wear his tinsel and, you know... Swag around a bit. It doesn't matter. There's a lovely quote I found uh, from a bishop whose name I've forgotten uh, at the time of uh, William of Orange, uh, William the Fourth, uh, King William. Uh, <laughs> Cow, Cow, third, 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 third. Yes, uh, it was. Uh, yes, we got this new king, uh, and that's okay because we, yeah, we had a problem with the old one. But please shut up about this uh, 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 right to overthrow the king. You know, this is uh, yes, it kind of happened, but let's pretend it didn't. He abdicated. That was the issue. yeah, yeah. But yeah, there were people saying, and this is how we do things around here. We don't like a king, we get rid of him. And, and this guy was saying, no, we don't want to be waving that line around anymore. We've got our king now. We, 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 we. He's the king. But the religion aspect is a, a, a yeah, I'm a yeah, I'm a believer in the divine right of kings. I'm just not a believer in God, which is a, 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 an issue. But uh yeah, and th this is obviously another part of you know, the question is A is is the kind of monarchy I want something that is utterly dependent on a religious justification and that we won't actually have it unless we have a religious revival, or B by tie, choosing to tie itself to a religious justification, the monarchy undermined itself when people ceased to believe the religious justification. That's the optimistic view from my point of view, that, that if we avoid tying the legitimacy of the king to our religion, then we're not vulnerable to the undermining of our religion being the undermining of our king. No, I don't think the great change of king was particularly religious. Just a quick comeback. Um, in the, I don't know when the, when the low point for the monarch was, I mean, when there was one, uh, probably about 1750, 1760, like that. You know, the four things had very little to do on. Um, but the farm wasn't doing much either. Uh, most, there wasn't a lot of power going to either, there wasn't a lot of wealth going to either. There were some silly wars. But um, slowly, around the country, where the law didn't much apply, rather than some of the old laws, some of the old laws rights and statutes didn't apply, that these towns were springing up. Industrialists were moving out there, that's where the water was, that's where the, uh, the free labour could go to. I mean, 
without either having much power, except the economic power, which isn't power at all. Um, so it's not a question of either or. I think, I think there might be one or the other, but the, the point is it's not even either or. There could be a monarch without much power, without much wealth, if Parliament didn't do very much. Why do we need are you saying either or, or do you want to, do you want the king to, do you want the monarch to arrive in Parliament every year and read the speech that we given? Well, I, the, the uh, I'm not a historian. The 18th century you're talking about, the, 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 the power of the kings had pretty much gone, I think, by then entirely. So we were under the rule of Parliament. <clears throat> but it was an aristocracy. It wasn't a, a, a mass democracy. It was an aristocracy that was very homogenous, that had very much the same ideas as each other and followed those same ideas. Um, we had actually a regathering of power with George III, who, 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 uh, who, who was very popular and was able to leverage that popularity and increase, I think, his power over what it had had before, although he didn't work as well as he hoped uh, across the Atlantic. Um, yeah, I mean, that was the world wars going on, that perhaps needn't have been. But, but isn't your ideal of the monarch who is the monarch, if we really have to use him in an emergency, you'll have all sorts of... I mean, well, in a sense, he has the right sort of... Yeah, I mean, the, the, <coughs> pro the, po the point is we don't use him. The point is that Christian is right. He uses us, you know. It would be nice... Yeah. It, it, he is the power. We, I would say, you know, that, that is what a powerful monarch would do. What would a powerful monarch do? He would live comfortably, you know, tax at one or two percent to live in the the highest luxury imaginable. Uh, so play, with it, more play with it. Is it really? I don't think it is. Uh, play with it. You know, play with his hobbies a bit. You know. Um, keep an eye out for foreign threats, for domestic threats. I don't believe, obviously, you know, since I want freedom, but I can do without the freedom to organize to overthrow the government. Uh, if the government, it, I would rather the government simply stamp it on those people who try to overthrow it than manipulated the entire society to the point that nobody wanted to. Um, so uh, a, a wise king, I think, would not, unless perfectly secure in a way that is rather implausible, would, would not tolerate those organising to overthrow him. So the, the freedom of speech and the press that is so gone on, you know, seems largely to be, you know, in Syria or whatever, the freedom to form a private army and overthrow the government. Well, I. I don't think that helps. That makes things worse. Uh, the government is better if you're not trying to overthrow it. That is, as I said, the strength of democracy, that we tend not to try to overthrow the government, except once every five years, and the government can, within that very limited time horizon, uh, not, not be so extreme in its uh, uh, struggle for power as the average dictator who could be, for whom every day is election day, because any day uh, some colonel could decide to uh, 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 grab a bunch of men together and have them shot. Um, um, yeah, I was just going to point about um, the power of the monarch in the 18th and actually to the 19th century. Perhaps when liberty in, in the kingdom was at its peak, power was dispersed between the laws, the commons, and the monarch. We have an active monarch, not necessarily an absolute monarch. I mean, I think even as, I think the last king, William IV, was the last king to appoint government against the will of Parliament mm. in 1833, I think. So I might moderate what you said, not necessarily have, have an absolute monarch, but certainly a more active monarch. Rather than our president, our president does very little. Well, I don't know. Everything that is presented to her by ministers. But that would, I, the, the, such a such a limited monarch would surely just be a, another player in the game, uh, and the game would go on and it would get rough. I, I uh, 
you know, the, the, the early monarchs, the medieval monarchs, were limited by practicality and technology. You know, they wouldn't know what some guy up in Lancashire was doing unless they showed up every three or four years uh, uh, to, to, to have a check and keep an eye on him and, and so on. And they just had to trust him in the meantime and give him a huge amount of authority in his own right in order that he would stay trustworthy in the meantime. Uh, the, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure what you say, 18th century, what, by what accident that worked out. I don't consider that a monarchical period, I must say, in this country. Uh, okay. This is a question that can't possibly be answered without another lecture or two. But um, of course, almost all of your talk in our response is to it presupposes there is a nation of which you are a member, and there are states that fit neatly around the nations, which libertarians don't normally take for granted. Well, it, it, it's not perhaps a necessary thing from first principles, but it, it exists. They are there. There is a nation. There are, and people, I mean, you know, one of the results of following this path is that I have found myself hanging out with reactionaries so in an internet way. You know, I, I, I have picked up some social conservatism. I've perhaps become infected with some, some social conservatism along those lines. Uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, I think there is a nation. I think um, the, it is, a, as I said, a natural instinct to follow a leader. Um, uh, I think... Uh, if you don't know, again, the post I wrote some years ago, you know, there is a virtue in in-group loyalty because that is what maintains a stable ruler and reduces the competition for power. If you destroy the idea of in-group loyalty, if you mix the in-group and the out-group uh, and, and cease to even request or, or value group loyalty, then you will find yourself taken over by those who do. Now, there are some excessively uh, uh, shrill uh, people who believe that that process is very advanced and that we are on the verge of a uh, uh, Sharia law and so on, and I believe they're mistaken, but they are not intrinsically necessarily mistaken. They are just over-alarmist and uh, 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 jump to a conclusion that is not yet justified by the facts. I think we are... Uh, yeah, it, it's a, a, I wrote a post recently on uh, Anders Breivik, who, who, who was of that view, that, that we were on the verge of being taken over. I don't think he was logically, I think his arguments were logically sound. I think his, uh, his, his uh, view of the evidence uh, is, is, is over alarmist and uh, uh, you know, coloured by a tinge of, of paranoia. Um, but uh, uh, what he said could be true, it just happens not to be. And yeah, I, I, as I said on my blog post, I have read it, I, I, I was reluctant to come out and say that about him, because really, what do I know about Norway? But he would talk about Luton, and I live in Luton, and his views on Luton were, uh, which is not paradise on earth, which has problems of in-groups and out-groups and, and group, group rivalry and so on. But it is, uh, his, it is not a war zone, there are not no-go areas. He, 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 his, his views are logically coherent, but not consistent with the facts on the ground. Is there any other speakers? Oh, thank you very much indeed. I think it's very, very entertaining. Thank you.